Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are in the last few chapters of uh, Acts. And when I say last few chapters, I mean the last few chapters. We're looking at uh, chapter 27 now, and there's only 28 chapters in general. So when we last left, Paul had uh, given his testimony to King Agrippa in the coastal city of Caesarea, both King Agrippa and Festus. Both said this guy isn't uh, doesn't deserve death, and he certainly doesn't even deserve to be in prison. But because he appealed to Rome, to Rome he goes, and this is all part of God's plan to go beyond the three missionary journeys that Paul had um, taken previously in the book of Acts which included going to synagogues in different public places. He's going straight through the Roman judicial and legal system. So we pick up with chapter 27 now, and let's pray and get into it. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And as we go into your word today, Lord, please open our hearts and minds to hear you speak for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 27, when it was decided that we, now there's that word we again, which means Luke is now with him. Luke is the undisputed author of this book, as well as the gospel of Luke. So whenever, and you can deduce this, by the way, by taking and looking at Paul's various letters and at the end seeing who was with him, when he wrote those letters, and whenever Luke is um, mentioned, it coincides with where Paul is in his ministry. So it's it's um, consensus that Luke certainly is the author of not only the Gospel of Luke, but also the volume two, if you will, which is called the Acts of the Apostles. So starting with chapter 27 again, when it was decided that we, meaning Luke and company with Paul, were to sail to Italy, they handed over Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Imperial Regiment. When we had boarded a ship of a Drymetium, we put to sea, intending to sail to ports along the coast of Asia, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. Remember, they, he's not really a prisoner. I mean, he's not worthy of being a prisoner. Everyone recognizes that. So there's leniency that they'll give Paul. This too is a mercy of God. Verse 4, when we had put out to sea from there, we sailed along the northern coast of Cyprus because the winds were against us. After sailing through the open sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we reached Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. Sailing slowly for many days with difficulty, we arrived off Snidus. Since the wind did not allow us to approach it, we sailed along the south side of Crete off Salmone. With still more difficulty, we sailed along the coast and came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. By now, much time had passed, and the voyage was already dangerous. Since the Day of Atonement was already over, this is the spring now, Day of Atonement, Paul gave his advice and told them, Men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward disaster and heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid attention to the captain and the owner of the ship rather than what Paul said. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, I think I may have said spring, I meant uh, winter. Since the harvest was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor in Crete facing the southwest and northwest, and to winter there. You know, there's a wintertime 
depending on where you are in the world, there can be some pretty, pretty bad weather. In fact, just not too long ago before doing this devotion, there was hurricanes that were going up at the, uh, the east coast of, of America. Um, I have a friend, Rich Spearman, that lives in Florida, and he says basically from the beginning of June until whenever it is, it's hurricane season. So you, you, there are seasons to this, and they are running into a season now where it is not hospitable to travel by sea. However, when you get Continuing on with verse 13, when a gentle south wind sprang up, they thought they had achieved their purpose. They weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a fierce wind called the Northeaster rushed down from the island. Since the ship was caught and unable to head into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. After running under the shelter of a little island called Kata, we were barely able to get control of the skiff. After hoisting it up, they used ropes and tackle and girded the ship. Fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the drift anchor, and in this way they were driven along. Because we, going back to... Luke using the plural, because we were being severely battered by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo the next day. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. For many days, neither sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. Now, no one planned for this. With regards to Paul's missionary journeys, whether it was um, taking Timothy or whoever he went, they had an idea of what to expect. They had a plan. This one, they don't. And many times weather bad weather, if it does damage and you're looking to capitalize, if you will, or, or to, to implement your insurance policy, the accident or any damage is considered an act of God. It's really what it's called, meaning it's way beyond our control. And in this case, you have to think that since all hope, as it says, finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. Even in the midst of this, the word of God that was given to Paul that he would go to Rome is the only truth that gave them hope. Even when the weather was against them for days. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like getting seasick. And it doesn't take much. I remember when we were in Southern California and we would take a... a a boat over to Catalina Island. It wasn't a long trip, but it was enough that after a while, there was a number of people that got sick. And every once in a while, I get sick. And when you get seasick, there's nothing that you can think about except for getting better. It just makes you sick. And in this case, they were sick for days. And yet in the midst of all of it, God is still working. He gives God, he gives Paul this, this um, promise that he's going to be with them, that they're not going to, he says, have courage for you've tested about me in Jerusalem. So it is necessary for you to testify in Rome. This is chapter 23. He gives Paul the assurance he's going to get to Rome. And only Paul has that assurance. So even when no one else has it, when everybody else is losing hope, the word of God still prevails. Even when you're physically sick, even when physically you, you're just drained because of the constant fighting of seasickness in the storm and just trying to stay alive in that storm. So it's a very powerful experience that not only Paul is going through, 
but so is Luke. And I'm glad that Luke went through it so that he can write it down for us. And we too can receive encouragement. Continuing with verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, you men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. Now I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing. I'm sorry. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told me. But we have to run aground on some island. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea. And about midnight, the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took soundings and found it to be 120 feet deep. And when they had sailed a little farther and sounded again, they found it to be 90 feet deep. Then fearing we might run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. Some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They had let down the skiff into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes holding the skiff and let it drop away. There's so much trust in Paul at this point. Now, because of the storm, the centurion and soldiers have great trust in what Paul is saying. So now his spiritual authority has even increased. Now, none of us would want to have to go through this to have any increase in our spiritual authority, but yet this is what is happening. In the most mysterious ways, none of us would choose it, and yet God's providence is perfect. In verse 20. Verse 33, when it was about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair from your head. So he's encouraging them. After 14 days of eating nothing, of fighting this this ship and the weather that that they find themselves in, he's still encouraging them because of the word of God. After he said these things and had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. And after he broke it, he began to eat. So once again, he's a test. He's a living testimony to the truth of God. They all were encouraged and took food themselves. In all, there were 276 of us on the ship. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the grain overboard into the sea. And I'm going to stop there and just simply say um, that it is amazing that even in the midst of a situation in which all hope appears to be lost, that the weather is so severe that they're not going to be able to survive it. After 14 days of not eating and being weak, and I'm sure being seasick, it is the word of God through Paul that gives them encouragement. And today, may the word of God give you that same encouragement. Maybe some of you are going through your own 14-day storm, and it feels like you're not going to be able to make it. Take courage. God's word is true. No matter how bad we feel, no matter how bad things look, he is faithful. He is true to his word. And we can have our comfort and encouragement in his word. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.